Okay, my name is Ron Minnick. Uh, I work at Google, and I'm going to talk today about sorcery. And part of the motivation is my goal that people should apply the right to repair for software as well, meaning that the software you use, you should always be able to see the source, and it should be accessible. And by that, I mean you can actually read the code because it's not overly complex, and you can compile the code. So I'm going to give a quick demonstration of what it looks like if you boot sorcery as your root file system. And what you're going to see here, I, I want to make it clear, you wouldn't normally see all this stuff, but I've broken it out to make it easy to see. So the first thing you'll see is an Elvis shell prompt, and then I'm going to run the sorcery init command the way you would run init when you boot, and then you'll see what happens next. So let's take a look, and you'll see all the, so that I occasionally mistype things. So I, you're going to see me CPU into a node. That was yesterday's talk, and then I'm going to run the init command for sorcery. So let's go. And what you can see is a lot of go action here. And what basically happened, uh, the init command did what it does, which is do some mounts, make some directories, that kind of thing, and then it ran Elvish which is the shell we use in uroot, but there was no Elvish binary. It had to compile the binary before it could run it, and so it compiled Elvish. But the trick here is that was a lot of stuff. It actually compiled the entire runtime for Go because the, the binaries for the Go runtime, the libraries and things, were actually not built. They were only there in source form. So it, it found Elvish, it found all the dependencies, and compiled them all. It is really the same as if you went to run bash and it compiled glibc as part of the first time you ran bash. And you could see that was pretty fast. This is the thing I've always liked about Go. You do this sort of thing and it's reasonably fast. So the next thing I'm gonna do is run the date command. And I'm, I'm gonna time it, but I mistyped the, the pass to time a couple times. But I'm gonna run time, and I have to compile time first time I use it, then I'm gonna run date, and I'm gonna time the amount of time it took to run date. So compiling two things, we're gonna time one of them. And that was about two-tenths of a second to completely compile and then run date. Now, the next time I run date, of course, I'm not compiling it. It's in a, in a directory in, in, in uh, RAMFS, so it's basically, you know, fast. And uh, so now I can do things like ls, and ls will be compiled the first time I use it. And I don't have to type the full path. I was just kind of showing you where it was. And then I can actually remove, if I want, everything in ubin, because that's where the, the compiled programs go. And then every time I run them, they'll get recompiled. But the, the key thing, so there I removed ubin star, then I ran date again, and it ran. And that's kind of the end of the demo. So then I shut it down. So the backup to that, if you have the, uh, there's a link to the slides in the talk, and then the link to the ASCII cinema is there if you want to just see this run yourself. Um, I'll point to a Docker at the end of the talk that you can actually just run all this stuff if you want to try it out. So what's the idea here? The, the goal of sorcery is to create a kernel portable, architecture portable, self-replicating root file system. And so when I say kernel portable, I want to go as far as things like plan nine. And that means that in the root file system I build, I can't have sim links, I can't have device special files, and I want to be able to use VFAT32. We may not like VFAT32 that much, but it is the universal file system at this point. Even UEFI firmware understands VFAT32. Uh, so multi-architecture, I can't have this explosion of kernel and architecture, the cross-product. So I want to have a minimal set of binaries on boot, which is like eight is, is kind of what you need. And I want the rest to be sourced. And on the, the file system I just showed you, there are about 40,000 files, all related either, um, you know, the Go runtime itself or the Go tool chain or the programs I actually want to run. And again, they're compiled onto first used into ubin. Notice Ubin isn't qualified for the, the, the kernel and the architecture because it's in RAMFS and every time you boot it evaporates and, you're, and it's gone. Uh, we want to assume read-only media because we, we really want to be able to run at some point with Flash again. And once booted, we'd like to make more of itself. I'll say right off, I don't have that working yet. That's not been a priority. The cost to build it, it's 90 seconds for architecture for a full build of the tool chain and 150 seconds for everything else. And in that, I include the Git clone and that sort of thing. So sorcery itself is a Go script. It, you know, it, uh, it's essentially you know, a Go program, but it kind of reads like a script, and it's 450 lines of Go. And so the result of all this is you get a tree that you can either create as an init RAMFS or as a root file system. It doesn't require VFAT32. It's just that I want VFAT32 to be an option, 
because that pushes you right to the edge of, of what you can do and what you can't. So sorcery is part of the Uroot project. Uroot is really widely used in firmware nowadays. There are millions of machines around the world in, in use by a number of hyperscalers, including companies like Google and ByteDance that have Uroot installed in firmware. Well, we, in that mode, we use what's called the BusyBox mode for Uroot, where the Go, we have a Go tool that rewrites commands into packages automatically. It can be any command. It's not a restricted set of commands like the original BusyBox and then compiles that into a multi-megabyte binary that we then place in Flash with a kernel. So Uroot was not really intended to be just firmware. The goal was a universal root because, you know, hubris, there's nothing like hubris, right, using the word universal. Uh, but, uh, you know, Plan 9 had demonstrated sort of multi-architecture root file systems. And when I was at Los Alamos doing supercomputing, we actually had a DVD that could boot on alpha, PowerPC and the two uh, word lengths of uh, AMD 64 type processors. So we knew that we could build a portable root file system that would kind of boot across any architecture and I wanted to bring source into that picture. And, and Go came along in 2010 and was a very fast, very compact compiler so it seemed possible to do that. So this work, the picture here is kind of the first firmware part that I put on an AMD motherboard. It's a 16 megabyte flash part and the kernel and Uroot part of that was about 12 megabytes. The, again, the, the dream was, you know, source in firmware. ARM kind of slowed us down a lot because the ARM processors, 32-bit, were kind of slow, and the ARM flash parts were kind of small. So we kind of went away in the firmware world from having source in Flash and went to a, a binary in Flash. And then Go modules kind of killed the way we, the little tricks I used to make source mode work in Uroot. So, we deleted source mode in the main Uroot project about a year ago. The thing is, though, everyone who used source mode would come back to me and say, source mode's kind of nice. It's kind of nice having the source there. It's kind of nice being able to make a quick tweak to a program and then run it and then just have the new version and maybe just throw that away if I don't like it. But having source always there is a really nice thing to have. So given that source mode is not part of the firmware picture at the moment, it was time to really step back and rethink some things. So going back to the core idea in 2011, here was the core idea. It was a root file system based on Go, mostly source. It booted with one or four or so pre-built binaries. When you typed a command, the command got compiled if it hadn't been compiled already. That's the core idea. If you ever use Perl Linux, that idea should sound a little bit familiar. Perl Linux had a Perl interpreter and the rest was Perl source. So this is just that idea brought to a compiled language. How does that little trick work? Path drove the actions in this 2011 version. Now I'm showing the way Path look in 2011. So back then we had a build bin, and in the build bin there was a tree of symlinks and a command called install command. And basically, if I typed sh and it wasn't in bin or ubin, but it was build bin sh, that was a sim link to install command. Install command would run, look at argvf0, figure out what command to build, build it, and then exec it. So the first time you ran the command, it got compiled. After that, you were just running the binary. So what do we keep and what do we drop? So we keep the Go-based root file system. We keep the goal of it being mostly source. The number of binaries I need to have seems to have doubled. It used to be about four, and now it's about eight. Just the Go tool chain got a little more complicated. Compilation on demand, path ordering to pick what runs, uh, installer being called install command, and I kind of want to get replication going again. Uh, we learned how not to have to use symlinks, so we're going to drop symlinks because they're not kernel or file system portable, and we're going to drop concerns about source constraints for the moment. So this was kind of a fun thing to work out. I just want to talk about it for a minute. Uh, it's a slightly different use of shebang files because shebang stands for shell bang, but I'm actually using shebang files but not to run a shell. So a lot of, a lot of people, including me, immediately thought that if, if I went away from symlinks and used shebang files, so I run, the, the, I run a command that's a shebang file and then that runs install command with an argument, it had to look like this first example here with pound, bang, bin, bash, and so on. But I did some experimentation on Plan 9 and Unix and OS X and discovered that if you make the first path a fully qualified, you know, a, a full path name and the argument a full path name, that will work across all those kernels in the correct way. It has to be done that way, though. I, I've tried other variations 
and on one or another kernel they don't work. Another fun part is Plan 9 and Unix tokenize shebang differently, so you have to be a little careful about getting too clever about adding arguments. And again, I've dropped for now. I don't, I'm not assuming an init ramfs is the target. I can work with an init ramfs, and if you try out the Docker, you'll see that it's pretty easy to build one. And I'm, I've dropped for now worrying about space. So that init ramfs I showed you, or that root file system, is 800 meg. This is one of the kind of things I'm not so happy about, but I'm not worrying about for the moment. The fun thing, though, is uh, I include the Git trees. And so I've always believed for a while now that I don't want my package manager to be spelled APT or RPM. I'd kind of like my package manager to be spelled GIT. And so Git is my package manager as well as my source manager. It's kind of a nice way to live. So I'm going to show you what a build demo looks like. I'm going to show you at 4x because I'm sure you don't want to see the Go toolchain build three times, but it, it's kind of interesting. So here we are. I start sorcery. And I'm going to time it, and then I'll exit. And so the first thing is I clone the Go tree. So I do that, and then you're going to see Go build three times because Go does this build it three times to make sure that it, you know what it's building is reproducible and doesn't drift. It's pretty important to do that. So it builds a local tool chain. That's where you see the, the um, Go bootstrap stuff go by, and then you see it building for the target. Now, if this were an ARM, I would have said go arc equal ARM and then run sorcery, and then I'd be building an ARM init RAMFS. So it's really very easy to build you know, different RAMFSs. And there I pulled down uroot, and now it's working out all the dependencies. There's a step where I basically say, figure out what all your dependencies are and bring down the source packages for that. So it's bringing those down. And Elvish has a lot of dependencies, so a lot of stuff comes down. And then the next thing is going to be Nichrome, which I'll get to in a minute what that's for. And so that stuff comes down. And then I actually bring down sorcery itself. I bring sorcery into the RAMFS, I be a git clone. And the reason is I want to bring sorcery along into the new file system, the eventual goal being replication. So that whole process took a minute, speed it up, and it's a four minute process in general. If I, for every architecture I add, it adds 90 seconds. Another way of looking at it is it's faster than the Octo configure script to do the whole thing. And the only language in all this is Go. There's no make files, there's no scripts, there's none of that stuff. It's just go. You run it, you compile the sorcery program and run it. So I've talked about how we get booted, we have an init, and, and the thing I haven't talked about is yes, but. And everybody kind of may be thinking, wait a minute, where's your system D? Where's your init scripts? Where is all that stuff? So we had a need to build uh, a, a basically a distribution for Chromebooks using Uroot. It was just an intern project that went really well actually over a period of years. And I had a great student named Ten Hong one year who we, we worked out how to do an init system that was nothing like anything that's been done and it was entirely written in Go. And the key idea is we define the idea of a service and the rules, the things the service had to implement and then we define what would be the root of the tree, which not surprisingly is called the service of services. So again, here's a link to what he wrote uh, about this. It's really pretty nice work he did. He'll show you in a minute what it looks like. But the core idea is that there's a service of services at a well-known address. Everything is restful. And every service that starts checks in with the SOS and gets told what it's going to do. So a service, in this case, is a program that manages any system resources which could be configured by the user. It listens on localhost port. Part of the reason for that is uh, we haven't yet found a way to make Go um, servers listen on Unix domain sockets. Unix domain sockets would be a little preferable, but this is what we were able to do, so it's what we did. But we do at least restrict it to localhost. It should have a web interface. Uh, at Google, pretty much everything is kind of uh, accessible that you can control via web interfaces. That gets to be surprisingly nice after a while. Yeah, yes, you go get these things programmatically, but at the same time, you've always got this ability to go out to a machine and, and do some inspection just via a web browser. That, that, gets, that really grows on you. It's nice. So we adopted that model for the services, meaning the init system. So it should have a web interface, it should have an HTTP server. It's, it, at all times, of course, that means it's programmatically controllable, but it's also accessible and controllable interactively. 
So again, uh, the service of services listens on localhost 8000. These services down at the bottom, basically each one contacts the service of services and gets told the port it's going to look on. So the service of services is at one time the directory and sort of the, the traffic cup for where messages related to services go. If you want to take your code and make it into a service, you use this client.go package. It's 147 lines, and now you've got a service. So what do these things look like? So initially, it looked like this thing at the top left. It was very, very basic HTML. This is a view into the service of services. So we're looking at the upspin service. I'll mention what that is in a moment. Uh, the service of services gave it port 33603, and this go there thing is you click on it, and it gets you a, 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 a um, tab that lets you look at you know, the upspin service. Jorge Betancourt knew a lot about how to do material design, so he gave us kind of a nice material design look, too. So if your browser can deal with material design, you'll get something that looks like that. And Trevor Farrelly added some new services. So one of the service of services in Nichrome is called Upspin. And Upspin is a, a Google project that was put together a few years ago. It's an end-to-end -end global encrypted file system. And the idea for Nichrome was that it was an entirely stateless laptop and all your files were stored in Upspin. And the model actually was that we could take the laptop and throw it in a, in a, in a dumpster at any time and we wouldn't lose a thing. So all your stuff was stored in Upspin and the, the, the security of Upspin has been incredibly well done. It's so good that people find it sometimes difficult to get enrolled, but we did work that part out. But you can see Trevor did an upspin FS, and then he did an LS of, of Tilly slash mount, and he could see his files here. So the, ser the, the service for upspin looks like this. You run, you, you're talking to this thing, you've clicked on go there, and you see username, directory server, store server, because the directory and store server are different hosts, and then your secret seed. And Trevor's had a good sense of humor. There it says shh, because you're never supposed to tell anyone your secret seed. But here's the really fun part about all this. They're just programs, right? I can run them anywhere. So what I did is I started this init system on my Mac. And at the top left is the service of services. At the top right is the time service. And you can see that in the top left, I've got a link to get from the, the service of services to the time service in the top right. The bottom two are the upspin thing. I clicked on it twice. But what tended was pretty cool is Notice that the entries are the same. And what had happened is I, I actually started the lower left upspin and filled it out. Then I started it again, and, and things are synchronized between the different services. So an instance of the Wi-Fi service, if I have two panes up and I select one Wi-Fi uh, network, it'll be reflected in the other Wi-Fi tab. So this is pretty neat what he did here is to keep all these things in sync, even though the different instances. But... The other fun thing is being able to do a complete debug of the init system on any machine I have, not just the, the Nichrome system when I'm running it. So this is the Wi-Fi service running on NetSurf. So this is from my T510. Upper left tab that you can't see would be the service of services, and the upper right tab is the Wi-Fi service. Here is a dependency, by the way, we have on iwconfig. So this did bring in a dependency on some C code that we'd rather not have. If anybody wants to talk to me after this about writing IWconfig equivalents in Go, I'd like to hear it because it's actually not that complicated. It's just that we ran out of interns in time. And yet the other thing to notice here is the Wi-Fi service does figure out, do you need an identity? Do you need a password passphrase? So there's a line in here somewhere where there's no identity or password passphrase box because it's an open, uh, open uh, Wi-Fi network. So here are the open questions, right? This works, but will people really tolerate this initial hit? There's an initial hit when you start some things, right? You compile things. And the very, very first thing you compile will result in compiling all the Go runtime from the Go tool chain that you need to basically run a program. That's not a non-zero cost. That, as you saw, it takes about initially maybe a minute. That might be more time than people want to tolerate. Is the footprint of this modern tool chain too large, right? That was a six to 800 megabyte image that I built there. And it doesn't have all the stuff you might think should be there. It doesn't have LaTeX. Uh, it doesn't have, I don't know, Bash. So we, we gain a lot by going with Go, all the sources there, but we lose some things. Now, it is possible in standard U-Root, and I'll bring this into Sorcery, to say, by the way, 
please bring in these other files or please bring in this other directory of executables and the code will actually say, fine, I'm bringing in all these executables. I'll bring in all the shared libraries they need too. It just kind of works that out and brings it over. So we're not, we're not an island. We're okay with bringing in other programs you want. We also have a tool that will bring down both uh, Pac-Man style packages and tiny core packages. So you can construct a root file system that's all this source along with packages from other distros to add other things you want. But again, there, there's, there's a little bit of a learning curve in other things here, but I, I still think the direction is good because there's just a ton of source on there. What about a browser? I'd really like the browser to be source. I looked at a lot of browsers when we were looking at Nichrome. We never really found anything quite worked unless it was called Chrome or Edge, call it what you will, or, or Brave or something. It just seems that the, the engines have to kind of be based around Chrome nowadays. The Go and Rust browsers, yes, they're coming along. Yes, they're all unfinished. Yes, they never quite work with everything. Uh, so you, it, it seems like your choice is you run NetSurf and don't use JavaScript, which is kind of, an, to me, in a lot of ways, kind of attractive, actually. Or uh, you, um, I don't know, you pull in Chrome. That's what we ended up doing on Nichrome. We decided just to make Chrome one of the things we included. Browser development, though, I, it just moves very fast, and you're always running to catch up if you're writing an open source browser from scratch. That's the problem. That's the thing I've seen with the, the Rust browser in particular. Uh, finally, the init system. Our init system is really different. It's not scripts. It's not systemd. Maybe people are a little too tied into the way things work. Systemd works really well, right? So maybe people aren't wanting to change away. I personally prefer the idea that I can talk to a service with a web browser tab rather than typing the system cuddle command because I can never remember all the options. I just, it just, you know, I just have difficulty remembering all the ins and outs of, of, of poking services and getting things to run. So I, I really have to tell you, I do prefer the idea that I can basically connect to any service with a web browser and find out what, what it thinks is going on. But open questions. So the summary, we can build kernel and architecture portable file systems. I've tried this on Plan 9. It works. And, and that's about as good an outlier as I can find, maybe. The, these file systems can be mostly source code. You can keep it in under 10 binaries per architecture in the base case. I think that delivering source-based file systems where things compiled is another pa part of guaranteeing the right to repair. I, I talked a little yesterday about bringing in down various tools like DHCP and TFTP and discovering they don't build, period. And that's more and more common, especially where C is concerned. You bring things down, 10,000 line configure script runs, it doesn't build. Happens to me all the time. And so everyone sort of has their specialized environment where things do build with their patches. But, but things that are just up there on GitHub, bring them down, try and build them, they don't. And I've, I've really never had that fail for me with Go. This is one of the reasons I like to use Go. If you want to try this out, uh, you can run docker run dash dash privilege. The dash IT means give me an interactive session with a terminal. And you'll be able to run the thing I ran at the start of the talk. You just, once you get the shell prompt, you run that, that, that init path. And you'll see it compile Elvish. It's really noisy. That's intentional. I've enabled the debugging so you have a chance to see all the steps it builds as it compiles things. And just type commands, and then you'll see things build. And then if you want, get back to me and tell me what should be different or better or what I got wrong. I'm happy to talk. And I guess that's it. Uh, thank you. So we have a minute or two for questions, if anyone has questions. Oh, you have, yeah, hey, Daniel. Uh, so the, um the idea with the web-based interfaces very much reminds me of uh, something uh, doing the same thing but out of band, the Intel management engine, right? Which also yeah. uh, has met, like some companies developing those interfaces. Um, I always found this kind of neat and some people are also very much afraid of it because it sort of exposes things to the outside. Um, but I, I guess if you limit that to listening to the local uh, host only, that could be fine. Now I'm wondering, because you're saying that, you know, in order to have like a full web browser, uh, you would need to pull in Chrome and a lot more. Um, how do those interfaces look in just NetSurf? Oh, so the question is, how do these things look in NetSurf if you don't have Chrome? And it's kind of like that. Okay. 
And I've actually, it used to work with links, and I don't understand what links is complaining to me about, but I have an empty, I, I'm not sending a form, whatever the hell all that means, but it, I think it could work in even links again. But the goal is it'll look, it should work with any HTTP client. And you're right, you, the other question, that, and I'll repeat it, is that, well, aren't you exposing this machine to the outside world? But these, we very explicitly restrict to localhost as the IP. And that, uh, <laughs> I've actually been hit by that when I did try and do debugging. It's like, oh, right, I've got to be on the same machine or I can't look at any services. But that also brings up the point about why did we want it initially to be a Unix domain socket? We wanted it to be even more local than localhost. So that, that's a good point. But yeah, the management engine, for example, does let you control it via the web browser, and this is sort of along those lines. But I will say, over and over, um, personal preference is I much prefer the idea that I've got a way to talk to each daemon with a RESTful interface rather than hunt through logs and, and try and remember how to type you know, these, some of these commands. So that's what we want with. Yeah. Uh, nice. That's, after, uh, yes. Continuously. Yeah, so that's a really good question. I think I, if I can paraphrase, the question is, how do you know all these things actually compile? And what we used to do in Uroot, and which I may bring back, is you, you can actually boot in a mode where it said compile everything. And I, I think we need to have that option, because you need, you know, you, what you lose if, if you don't at least test it once that it compiles is do as it built. And I agree, that, that's, that's the thing I didn't really address, but needs to be addressed. Yeah. Uh, was there any other? Was there any question on the on the um, stream, or did anyone even get on? Maybe no. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. So you I know. You know. I. Yeah, you're right, and um, that's a really good point. There's this, the, the, the point is being made with the question is, what if I go to a website that has, I guess it's called an iframe with localhost in it? Yeah, that's, uh, there you're into an area of things that I'm not very good at, which is security on these web type things, so. Uh, your friend, the Professor Lefebvre, for will tell you. Uh, so modern web browsers. We've got a good answer here, yeah, them. yeah. Um, uh, they have options that you can send as headers and the web browser will then say, okay, I will not render this in a frame. It's called the X-Frame Options Header. Okay, um, X-Frame Options Header, okay. That is part of uh, yeah, the whole puzzle. But there is much more to it because you also need to not allow people to just send requests from any other origin. Uh, so just in case uh, you're tempted to, do not send chorus headers, the cross-origin resource gallery. So, yeah, if you do not do that, browsers, modern web browsers will also not allow you to send requests uh, across origin. Still, um, now that I have some experts here, I know who to ask this question when I get back and say, what did I get wrong? So, thanks. That was, that was really good, good to hear. Uh, um, another hint uh, on the question regarding do all the binaries compile. So, on, on GitHub, we use, or also on other platforms, uh, continuous integration to make sure everything always builds, right? And we also run uh, tests. Sometimes it will get connected without uh, some. Well, uh, well the, other, the other thing, Daniel, Daniel's, uh, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> Go ahead. It, sometimes it'd be. A, it, it, sometimes pull requests are accepted without um, success of the ICD pipelines or anything else because it is working, all is okay. I know it's, it's, it's such behavior. So sometimes pull requests are accepted without CI/CD. Well, then the other thing here is, sorcery lets you include anything you want, and so I can't possibly really model that on the on the CI. And so we really do need an ability to say, build it, and then as a, a post processing step, you have the option of saying, compile everything as a test to make sure it really works. So the other thing we used to do in Uroot on the boot. We had an option where we would say, hey, you know what? 
just build every command when you boot because I want to test that. But that kind of works against the grain of compile and demand. So I think I, I would prefer the idea that there would be a way to test it by saying compile everything in this thing I just built. It's probably what we would do. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Uh, so any other questions? All right. Well, I really appreciate, I know it's the last day and it's early in the morning also. I really appreciate uh, people coming out and listening. So thanks. And uh, I guess that's it. <laughs>